Mark Goodall is an anthropologist, social legal scholar, and social theorist. He is currently Associate Professor of Conflict Analysis and Anthropology at George Madison University and Series Editor of Stanford Studies in Human Rights. He is the author or editor of eight books including, most recently, Neoliberalism Interrupted, Social Change and Contested Governance in Contemporary Latin America, and the other book, Human Rights at Crossroads. Thank you, Mark, for being here. Thank you. It's a great pleasure. Uh, tell me a little about your personal and intellectual history. How did you become interested by human rights? Well, first of all, thanks for having me here. It's wonderful to be part of this this project um, at uh, SEASH. Um, so I, uh, I'm an anthropologist by doctoral training, and I, uh, during my doctoral work, I uh, went to Bolivia in Latin America to study conflict resolution. And I had a, a vision of my work that I would be studying conflict resolution in the rural areas outside of the boundaries of the state. And when I arrived in Bolivia, I discovered that uh, Bolivia was in the midst of a human rights revolution. This was during the period of the, the, the neoliberal period of the 1990s. And so I had to take an interest, a research interest, in the effect of human rights activism on conflict in rural Bolivia. So I started my, you know, my, my experience with, with human rights comes as a researcher, as an empirical researcher. Uh, and that work led me to more theoretical work, reflecting on the meaning of human rights, the experience of human rights in the contemporary world. Uh, so I'm fundamentally a, an empirical researcher who has an interest in using empirical research, social science research, to transform, to redefine the way we think of human rights and the way human rights is understood at the international level. Mm -hmm. Very well. You have been reflecting and writing on human rights for a long time. How do you see, what is the role that human rights can play in social transformation and in tackling the neoliberalism, capitali capitalism in uh, the contemporary world? Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, there are several things I would say about that. Um, the first is that, uh, as my colleague Richard Wilson has, has argued, uh, in, especially after the end of the Cold War, human rights as a political rhetoric, as a program for political change, mm -hmm. as a, an alternative legal framework, has become the only secular legitimate framework for social change. Uh, and, and, and of course by legitimate we mean legitimate according to the international community, legitimate according to the community of transnational uh, non-governmental organizations. And so if we look around the world and we see processes of social change, we immediately notice that human rights plays a role. So whether, so that's the first point. The first point is that human rights is the, it's not so much a vehicle for social change, it's the framework in which social change takes place. So that's an empirical fact. Um, now the second part of the question is, is that a useful framework? Is that, has human rights proven to be useful uh, as a vehicle for social change, and if so, how, and if so, and if not, why not? Uh, that's of course a big question. We can think comparatively across many different, many different cases. But what I would say is I would use two examples to, to, to point to in which human rights has, been, has, has played the most important role as the vehicle for social change. The first would be the case of South Africa in the early 1990s, and the second would be the case of Bolivia in the late 2000s. And they're actually connected, as I'll explain. In the first case, South Africa was one of the first new countries uh, to, to emerge. This is the post-apartheid, of course, South Africa, to emerge after the end of the Cold War. So by that time, human rights was already a much more powerful force in the international community. And so human rights became the definitive logic that structured the new constitution. So we had uh, the rights of, 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 of culture and collectivity, we had rights, uh, his, rights uh, human rights dealing with historical injustice, rights dealing with land redistribution. All of those first, second, third, fourth generation rights were part of the South African Constitution. Uh, the problem with the South African Constitution is that in the, in the writing of it, they were the, the ANC activists and those who, who, were, who were really intent on making South Africa a new human right, a model for human rights around the world, they had to make compromises with the existing elites in South Africa. And we know this by 
to various books on South Africa. So on the one hand, they, they, were, they wanted to make human rights by f clearly the, the vehicle for social change and, 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 and post-apartheid reconciliation in South Africa. On the other hand, they didn't want this to provoke too much conflict, and so the activists and the constitutional lawyers in South Africa had to compromise. Uh, nevertheless, South Africa has, the South African Constitution is one of the most important human rights instruments in the world. So looking at South Africa from 1993-1994 to the present, what we see is that the social transformation in South Africa has been incomplete at best. Uh, whether that's the fault of human rights or not is another question, um, but some have argued that because the South African Constitution was so dependent upon human rights, it prevented South Africa from exploring other avenues for social change. Avenues which might have been more connected with earlier Marxist or socialist models, or avenues which would be based in other other doctrines of, of social change. Um, so I think in the case of South Africa, looking back decades now on the on the uh, on the on the human rights uh, constitution, we can see that human rights has been has has played a, has had a mixed record in South Africa. Now fast forward to the to the two th to the late two thousands in Bolivia. So in Bolivia we have the election of the first indigenous president of Bolivia. His election would, was made possible by the coming of human rights to Bolivia during the time I just mentioned in the 1990s in which people started to talk about rights, they started to talk about indigenous rights, and so his, in a sense, his rise was, was made possible by the, by the prevalence of human rights discourse in Bolivia. But once Evo Morales took power, he too, like in South Africa, said that we were going to write a new constitution, and so Bolivia undertook to write a new constitution. And interestingly, it's related to South Africa in that the very first international trip, foreign trip that the, the Bolivian president took, was a delegation to South Africa, stopping in Europe, of course, because they don't have planes that can go that far, but stopping in Europe and making his way to South Africa, in which the, during which the, the advisors to the president met with the ANC lawyers and the activists who wrote the 1994 constitution, 1994-95 constitution in South Africa. And they, they said that we, we admire your constitution, we admire the fact that it was an attempt to create a new society after a period of rapid trans transformation, transition or revolution, what do you have to teach us? And they talked about the, the, the use of human rights, they talked about the fact that they had to make compromises. And so the lessons that the Bolivian activists took with them was that the South African Constitution didn't go far enough. It made too many compromises to existing power uh, in, imbalances and the existing elites. So when Bolivia, when Bolivia wrote its new constitution in 2000 and 2007 and 2008, and it was finally uh, ratified in 2009, what they produced is what they thought was now a constitution which went much further as a vehicle for social transformation using human rights than the South African Constitution. Um, and I think looking at both of those constitutions, looking at both of those models for, for social change in which human rights is a key framework, you can see that the, that the Bolivian constitution is a much more radical document. It's a, in a sense a purer document. Now what do we know about what's the experience of, of, of this much more radical human rights instrument as a vehicle for social change? Bolivia has also now been racked by conflict. Less so because the Constitution itself is a compromise vehicle for social change, but because in the implementation of it, they've come up against conflict with various kinds of interest in Bolivia. So I think what I would conclude from that is that is that human rights as a rhetoric, as a model, as a framework for, for social change has become the dominant framework. In many ways, the only le I agree with Richard Wilson, the only legitimate secular language for social change. But as an actual vehicle, in the implementation of human rights, in the, in the enforcement of human rights, in processes of revolution or rapid transformation, uh, the, the record of human rights is, is more mixed. It, it doesn't mean that there's another alternative out there that would be, that would be a, more, a better, more efficient vehicle for social change. Uh, but I would say that that's the, that's, the lessons, that's the lessons that we draw from these case studies. In your latest book, Human Rights at the Crossroads, you argue that uh, the end of Cold War is a, a very important moment for human rights. Mm -hmm. Can you explain mm -hmm. more about this? 
So in, in the Human Rights at the Crossroads is an attempt to uh, bring together a group of interdisciplinary scholars. I mean, I, the first thing I would say about the, wor the work of human rights that we're doing is, is that we spent the first 10 years, say, from the late 1990s to the late 2000s, making the argument that an interdisciplinary approach was not just necessary epistemologically, but was demanded ethically. In other words, that the questions that were at stake, that are at stake in the area of human rights practice and human rights enforcement are just too important to be left to the discipline, particular disciplines. So that argument was being made for, let's say, the first 10 years. I think we've, what's exciting, I think, in my own career is that we've now gotten to the point where you don't have to, it's taken for granted that this is a, an area which has to transcend, uh, transcend particular disciplines, which I think is one of the reasons why Sayash is is such an important development because um, because that's the kind of approach that that's being taken here. Um, so this book is an attempt to bring this interdisciplinary an interdisciplinary group of scholars together, and not just scholars, but people who are who are who are active in human rights practice. Bring them together to to to, to take stock of the status of human rights in the current moment. So to do that, we have to define what we mean by the current moment. And for again, for this period that we that I was mentioning, this, these these decades, uh, the past decades, is we've been used to talking about them in terms of a transitional or a liminal period, uh, which is often referred to as the post Cold War. Just objectively, the period after the Cold War. But this is not simply a historical description. As I said, it's the, to talk about this period after the Cold War as a post Cold War, is to is to talk about a transitional period which hasn't become something in its own right. It is necessarily a time after a period in which, that was defined by certain characteristics. And these post periods, these transitional periods, tend to be marked by creativity, uh, the dissolution of hierarchy, the emergence of new uh, lines of social relations. And that, I think, is what we see in this period after the end of the Cold War, the post-Cold War for human rights. Is it, was, it was a time that human rights rushed in to fill the vacuum left by the, by, the, by the end of the Cold War. We have a real explosion in human rights activism um, um, in this period. Uh, but what we argue in this book is at some point this liminal period has to come to an end. That the post-Cold War, a period of transition, eventually gives way to the emergence of a new period, a new historical moment, uh, in which, which, is, which is different than, the, than, than in this case the Cold War. Uh, which is not completely new. Uh, there are similarities in terms of economic and political and social structures, uh, but there are key differences, and that's the whole point of a transitional period: is to give give time for new, new, uh, new, new points of emergence. So we argue in this book. We, what we do in the book is we say, let's assume for 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 purposes of argument that the that this liminal period has come to an end. Then wh how would we characterize this new moment, this new period, after the end of the Cold War, after the end of this period of liminality? So the book is an attempt to define or describe, characterize what this what this what this new moment looks like mm -hmm. uh, for purposes of human rights. What role does human rights play in this in this in this period after the end of the Cold War, after the 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 period of liminality and limitless possibility has ended? So. So things are not, not everything is possible after the end of this liminal period. You know, certain avenues are now foreclosed, mm -hmm. and in purposes for purposes of human rights, what's interesting is human because human rights has become dominant, as Richard Wilson Art and others would I think rightly argue, that does does mean that alternatives to human rights as a vehicle for social change now are less likely than they were in the period of the post Cold War when human rights was was jostling with other possible frameworks for for social transformation. Now, of course, because it was the end of the Cold War, the most obvious alternative to human rights are those based in Marxist or materialist or political economic approaches, which focus on economic relations of production, which are much more active in terms of a theory of social social change, um, which put the emphasis much more on 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 economic those you know those classic rel relationships to the means of production and so on. That, because of for historical reasons, that way of that way of understanding social change was no longer relevant or no longer possible for most for most progressive progressives. Um, and it, and and I would say that after the after the end of the post Cold War, uh, it's not as if those 
those older alternatives are any more popular or relevant or, or I guess, legitimate. Um, so, so that's what we argue in the book is that there are these. In some ways, we're in a we're in a third a third period in the post Cold War history of human rights. The first period being the Cold War, in which human rights was was suppressed because of the logics of the Cold War. The second period being the post Cold War, a time of liminality and, and 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 creativity and possibility in which human rights emerges. And now we're in a third phase, in which um, human rights, uh, in which in which that that the liminal period of the post Cold War has come to an end. New hierarchies have emerged, and human rights now must take its place in this new in this new world, okay. which is long, which is primarily a neoliberal a neoliberal world. And yes. um, you are an anthropologist. Uh, from your experience, how do you see the practice of ethnography in a world in a time uh, when uh, social life is so transnational? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it, 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 social life is transnational, and it's not transnational. You know, I think one of the things I would say, and this is, this is, this is um, a critique I have of, of, of the kind of broader um, discussion around globalization, is that um, our analyses of global transformation tends to be shaped by our own experiences. And I think it's I think leaving aside populations like refugees and asylums and inter and displaced peoples, I think it's not a coincidence that theories of global interconnectedness and global change and and movement tend to be articulated by in, by by primarily um, activists and intellect intellectuals who themselves have a, a transnational globalized life. Uh, it's not to say that the theories of globalization are disingenuous, but I think. And this is where ethnography comes in. As an ethnographic question, the lives of most people around the world have not become more interconnected or globalized. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I think we, you and I were talking the other day about the, the the percentage of people, or actually, no, it was one of the students in the program who's from Mozambique. He was talking about the percentage of people in Mozambique, for example, who, who have access to the internet, who use the internet, and it was like less than four percent of the population of Mozambique regularly uses the internet. So if the internet is a kind of symbol or even a method of interconnection in which global relations can be virtually more connected, then if that's if if that if those if that statistic of Mozambique is similar to other places in the world, and I think it, it it's kind of an extreme extreme example, then I think the extent of interconnectedness is 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 relative to particular populations. Um, so and and I think ethnography helps us make sense of the relationality of interconnectedness and social and global social relations. Um, it, you know, it doesn't mean that the internet and air travel and other kinds of things in the last 40 or 50 years have not made it possible for populations to move in, in, in ways that they did it. But um, I'm, my research in Bolivia, especially my research in rural Bolivia, has led me to, to, to believe that, that um, For example, in Bolivia, most people in in the villages and the rural areas, their lives have not changed at all dramatically, beca dramatically because of uh, because of these, these innovations. So, um, so I think that's a that's something to keep in mind. How we understand the relationality of of these relationships between the globe between the global north and the global south, uh, and how our own position in that broader process influences our our in, our theory, our analysis. Mm -hmm. You were talking about refugees and asylum seekers. Is that the topic of your interest? And how do you see that that topic can help us to explain the relations between the North and the South? Well, it certainly is becoming a, a, a topic of greater interest. Um, as, you, as, you, as you said, most of my research has been, my empirical research has been in Bolivia and, and Latin America, but increasingly I've become interested in the case of the, 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 the case of um, Uh, the situation with refugees and asylum seekers here in Europe, because I think that uh, there are a lot of there, there's a lot we can learn from the status of refugees in Europe, because many of the Western European countries are so critical to the promotion of human rights around the world, uh, and the fact that there are tensions which are emerging in places like um, Norway and Switzerland and Sweden and Denmark, when they're the fruits of These their, the, these countries' commitments to human rights are born in the form of refugees and others, 
who are coming to them by virtue of their status as as promoters of human rights and now we see a tension sometimes it's a tension between uh, that involves doctrines of nationalism sometimes racism as in the case of Norway or the case of of, of Denmark and sometimes in the case of Sweden it's 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 the tension between competing value systems which are equally uh, useful or equally potentially progressive such as in Switzerland you have a tension between human rights and theories of democracy um, in which from the from the from the part of the theory from the part of the side of democracy Switzerland gives local air local regions the right to regulate refugee populations and a lot of these local communities are passing regulations which restrict their movements which in a way violate their human rights once they arrive in Switzerland so these large numbers of refugees come to Switzerland by virtue of the Swiss commitment to human rights and while they're in Switzerland their human rights are being violated by virtue of the Swiss commitment to a, theor a Rousseauian theory of direct democracy. So I think that there's, as a, as, a, as, a, as a research question, there's a lot to be learned now about the case of human rights here, at the, here, at, here in Europe, you know. Um, and I think another implication that we might, that we've, I think we talked about the other day was this whole dichotomy between the global north and the global south is problematized, I think, by the increasing number of refugees many of whom come from the so-called Global South, who are coming to Europe. This maybe speaks to the question of interconnectedness, because the Global North and the Global South is partly a geographical and is partly a historical reference, a dichotomy, but it's certainly a dichotomy. And what happens if an empirical analysis shows that there's much more of a connection? People coming to the, to, from Somalia, or in the case of, again, coming back to Bolivia, the, the uh, there was a time in which the largest number of Bolivian Bolivians out of Bolivia were in the United States. Now they're in Spain, so there's this, and, they're, and the Bolivians are constantly coming and going. So in those cases, those are not refugees; they're maybe economic migrants or economic refugees. But you have a lot of you have people coming and going. You have the transfer. You have the intermix, intermixture, inter, uh, the rise of inter, intercultural interculturalism. Um, and so I think the whole, it is in the process of destabilizing the distinction between the global north and the, and the global south. Uh, not to mention the fact that here we are in Portugal, and Portugal, from a different perspective, is kind of the south of the north. You know, Portugal, like Malta, like Greece, like some of the, the smaller economies that are both geographically on the periphery, as Portugal is, but also economically on the periphery, that's dealing with a tremendous debt crisis, I think is... In, this, in a sense experiences some of the same real or imagined mar marginality uh, in relation to Germany, in relation to Berlin, in relation to France as countries in the traditional global south might experience in relation to say Portugal. And so I think again they, that's another, another interesting destabilizing dynamic um, which in a way makes Portugal in some ways a much more interesting place to do s critical social science than in Germany. To, with, all, with all, you know, apologies to my colleagues in Germany, because you have this, these multiple scales, these multiple forms of rel multiple relativities that are at work here. Um, do you think that, if I make you this open question, what do you think that Europe, Europe has an history of colonialism, epistemological arrogance, what do you think that Europe can learn with the rest of the world, and in particular with the global south? Yeah, well, I mean, of course, we just, I just got done talking about how the global north and the south are, are problematic concepts. Maybe a, a negative way, an obviously negative way, and there's a kind of positive form of Orientalism, a, a beneficent or a progressive Orientalism, which suffers from some of, the same some of the same problems as the former. In other words, it's a simplification, a construction which reflects more of our own predispositions than it does the reality in the places we're interested in. And what I mean, of course, is that the, the, bad, the bad Orientalism is the Orientalism which constructs the Global South as a place, a backward pre-modern zone of, of cultural practices for, term, for purposes of human rights, which violate human rights norms and which need to be changed in order to help countries in the Global South develop and have autonomy and so on. That's a kind of progressive form of Orientalism. It's still... It's still an Orientalism in a way, but it's progressive. Uh, but but there's another way that, that that this happens, which is that the there's a belief that 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 if we get if we don't 
want to impose our, our values, we don't want to impose a kind of Western, in this case, as you said, a Western epistemology. We don't want to do so because we believe that there is a better or a more emancipatory alternative lurking in the global south, yet to be discovered, and that if only we, we leave societies in the global south to, the, to their own devices, these these more progressive alternatives, whether epistemological or social or theoretical, will emerge. But that's again, that's a, that's a, that's another form of Orientalism. Um, you know, in the in the case of Latin America, the the analogy I would give is that there's there's been a constant belief among people who study public health that somewhere in the Amazon there's a cure for cancer. You know, somewhere there's locked up in indigenous knowledge systems there's a an a, a a set of a set of epistemologies about the natural world or about plants or, or something which will lead to the cure for all of our ills you know and in some like I said in some ways that is an, a form of orientalism which harkens back to the naming of America itself I mean the name America or Latin America or the United States of America came from a kind of romanticizing of of the new world as a place of pr interestingly primarily female bounty and and, and uh, untouched beauty, you know, and that the modern the modern hand was could only corrupt that. So for progressives in the in the in the global north who are very um, supportive and, and sympathetic to the global south, we always need to be careful that it's we're not engaging in a in a process of, of rev like a reverse Orientalism or, or progressive Orientalism. Um, now, having said that, does it mean that there's not there aren't you know it. We, we certainly want to be want to make sure that we have the widest possible scope for ideas about human rights, about the nature of the person, about the relationship between the individual and the collective. And we want to make sure that that wide scope is not one which is being shaped by some broader political power or legacies of colonialism and so on. Uh, how, I don't know how to do that, right? I don't know it's hard to think about how you clear the clear the clear the slate. So this brings me back to the, your first question about ethnography. So again, without pre, without presupposing what 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 is what what kind of epistemological diversity is out there, I would I would I, I would prefer to let that the answer to that question emerge from from an engagement a, 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 an engagement based on mutual respect, on an appreciation for for diversity, um, and uh, and a willingness to learn. Thick description. Thick description, exactly. Yeah. One last question, mm -hmm. uh, and it is about the United States, you are an American, mm -hmm. and I can't resist to ask you, what do you think about double standards in the way that the United States, uh, the relation with human rights, for example? How mm -hmm. do you think that human rights are used for internal purposes and in uh, foreign affairs? Well, that's, that's a good question, and I, I, you know, I think there's, there are a lot of paradoxes and ironies when we think about the United States. Um, you know, a lot of Europeans um, forget that the Declaration of Independence came before the French Declaration of the Rights of Man. Um, in other words, people often point to the French Declaration of the Rights of Man as the first modern human rights document um, that emerges from the period of the social of social contract theory. But in fact, the Declaration of Independence was was a, over a decade before that. Now, of course, both the French intellectuals and, and activists and the and the the, co the colonial Americans were influenced by the same the same group of theorists. But the fact remains that in 1776, a group of white, some slave owning, uh, some not, some very anti-slavery uh, activists got together and decided that they had had enough of the colon of the English colonial empire primarily for economic reasons, right? They were having to pay higher taxes, and like a lot of colonial colonials, uh, colonial uh, possessions, they were being exploited, which is the whole purpose of colonialism. But they got together and decided that they were going to break free of, the, of England, uh, and they were willing to die for, for, for that. And in that statement, they wrote in the Declaration of Independence, that the reason why we, 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 we want to break away, the reason why we believe this is unjust, is because this relationship violates a single principle, and that is the principle that all men are created equal, and they're endowed by their creator, meaning God, with certain inalienable rights. 
and those rights are, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That is a pure articulation of the idea of human rights. In some ways, it's a pure articulation than the French Declaration of the Rights of Man, which started with that, but then muddied it, or, or complicated it with the notion of citizenship. So in France, you, you started with the notion of natural rights, and then they added citizenship, which had the effect very quickly of changing the statement of, of human rights. So the United States, what became the United States of America, was really the first, the first country in the world, I think. Yeah, the first country in the world to base its political structure on the idea of human rights. Now, what happened after that is, is a complicated story, um, a, a historical story, but, but basically what happened was is that the country that started out as the first human rights, country, the first human rights nation state um, started to, 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 to reduce the scope of their understanding of rights until it became the same as the rights of citizens, the rights of, of Americans. And when that happened, uh, and it happened without, I mean, that was not a conscious political decision. It just it happened through historical circumstances. When that happened, the United States found itself in the peculiar situation of being a country which feels itself completely dedicated to human rights, and in fact sees itself as playing a historical role in the, in, in the, in the emergence of human rights, both in the 18th century and later after World War II, but whose rights consciousness is not a human right is not shaped by human rights at all, but shaped by the rights of citizens, like in France, let's say, after after the French Revolution. So in some ways the United States is 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 in a really difficult situation because we have a a, a wrong image of ourselves. We believe that we are that we have a, a national rights a consciousness which is shaped by human rights, but in fact it's not. And the problem with that is that prevents the emergence of a real critique of our rights consciousness from a, from a perspective of human rights as, as something which is external to or something which it would be a new direction which we might go in as a country because we the, the country thinks itself already as a defender of human rights um, and, and when in fact what, what determines our, our policies are really a, a, a dedication to national, secure, national interest and the, and the interest of our country as such not as a re representative of some broader human rights Human rights uh, community, um, so so I think the United States is going to be very problematic going forward because it's an important country economically and militarily and otherwise. And if it were more like Norway, for example, if we could take a country which is much more influenced by human rights both internally and externally, and give it the same global influence as the United States, I think that would make a real make a real difference. But I don't see that happening. And on the other hand, we have countries like China and India who are also important for other reasons, both for, by population and also by economy, and they have, there doesn't seem to be any indication whatsoever that they're going to become part of the movement to promote human rights uh, globally. So what we're left with is the promotion of human rights, the development of human rights among certain uh, important but sort of second-tier European countries in terms of their influence globally, and then most more importantly, in the in this what we were talking about before the so-called global south where you have relatively weak countries which then are much more able to engage in experimentation with human rights they're much more willing to they're much more willing to uh, uh, engage with uh, NGOs and develop the development community which now has become influenced by human rights so where that is taking us in the future I don't know but I don't unfortunately I don't see the United States um, changing its national identity anytime soon to realize in a sense as a recognition that there's this paradox at the heart of our of our national of our national consciousness okay thank you very much thank this you was a great interview